pines in the pine weather. Welcome to the Yukon in North 61. Today I want to talk to you about one concept as I get ready for caribou sheep season one more time. And that's wheat. So I have tooled around uh, hunting at 295 pounds, 300 pounds. It's a killer. So I've been pretty careful lately. I'm down to uh, 253 and I've got 20 more pounds to lose by the season and I'm on, on track to do that. So I'll be 230. So that's, you know, 60 pounds less than when I, uh, that's basically allows me to bring my whole backpack of gear and still weigh the same I did with no backpack before. It's incredible. But, you know, even when you're heavier than you should be, I still think you really have to pay attention to your gear weight. In fact, when you're a heavier hunter, it's even more important because there is a certain uh, physiological barrier to weight. And if you're already 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight and you start carrying 50 pounds of gear, you're now putting a hell of a lot of pressure on your joints. So I think it's a good idea always to be very, very cautious of the weight of the equipment that you're bringing with you. Two years ago, I didn't realize how good I had it. I've often thought having a donkey would be great, but two years ago I had a donkey. He was a 16 year old boy and he could carry as much as a donkey and uh, he was a great companion. So uh, he carried this and my tripod, I carried my rifle. This is 100 ounces. My rifle is about 100 ounces with the scope. If I'm going solo or if I'm going with someone who's not a big carrier, I'm not sure that I want to carry this much. This is a perfect instrument. It's a great instrument. When conditions are right, I can go right out to two kilometers and start evaluating uh, sheep horn. And uh, I don't do the rings too much. I think it's a very, very tricky business. I've, I've gone now and taken a look at uh, sheep horns right up close. Sometimes they fool you even right up close. So I'm gonna look for an obvious full curl and you can do that out to two kilometers with this when conditions are right. But you've got a column of air two kilometers wide. If there's heat waves, other aberrations, you now don't have the perfection. And I'll, like I'll show you a picture of 2.5 2 kilometers when there was uh, a wind and there was tremor. You don't have the perfection, although it's perfect within itself. So, uh, this gives you as much distance as possible. You can always get up to 50 power, but when you when you can get to 50 power, that's, it's great and it's a perfect instrument for that. But do I you know, want to carry 200 ounces of gear plus 20 ounces of binoculars, so 220 ounces with my rifle before food, before anything, if I'm going solo or if I'm going with a, with a non-donkey partner? So that's the question. What's another option? My lightest option, which is uh, 22 ounces basically, is this scope, the Leupold 20 by 50, uh, with really actually good optics. It's got a fixed eyepiece. The fixed eyepiece gives long eye relief, so I can use this with my glasses. And it's got the Red Mountain Gear uh, tripod base which is designed to use these guys, which I always have with me is my pole. So I always have two poles with me. My partner will have a pole. And if I go by myself, I'll have to bring another pole, eight ounces. That's still a 30 ounce package. So uh, basically these form the legs of your tripod and they fit in there. And it's uh, really good for a lightweight tripod. Uh, I don't think it's as good with a heavyweight tripod. Heavyweight scope. The other advantage of this little 20 by 50 guy is I think I can leave my binoculars at home. Controversial, but uh, I can handle this and it's got a good field of view, especially if I use my stick as a bit of a monopod. I can actually handhold this and because I'm looking for white sheep, if it hasn't snowed, I can pick them out with my open eyes. So I don't need the binoculars so much. But I know everybody loves binoculars. I find for dull sheep hunting so far, and I'm not super experienced, but so far I haven't found them to be all that uh, as, as important as a good spotter. So there, I go from 100 ounces, 102 ounces, down to 23 ounces. Now, because I max out at 20 power here, I can do at 800 yards, but I can do at 50 at two kilometers. But because I don't have 2000 meters of uh, air, 
I'm actually probably doing better. Even though this isn't as perfect an instrument, it doesn't have that long column of air. So I'm actually doing pretty well at the 800 meters with this. And I'm gonna shoot at six, so I think I can start evaluating. And I've never seen a situation where the heat waves are so bad that I still can't use this uh, because it's only 20 power. So that is a possible answer for some trips. And this next thing is something completely unexpected. Um, I got this from Ted Wagner. Some of you might have heard of that fella. And he had one at the range, and I liked it so much that he actually found me one. And this is a bow scope, uh, Bosch and Loam from the 60s. So I got the 80s here covered with this loophole. This is from the 60s. The coatings aren't the greatest. It's not nearly as bright as either of these instruments but it's a 20 to 60 by 60. And honest to goodness, it's really, really quite clear to 40. Between 40 and 60, you start getting more distortion, especially with a bit of atmospheric effects. So I, I think you're good to 40 power with this guy, usually. So again, at 40 power, that gets me to 1.28 kilometers. That's pretty good. And this is about 40 ounces, and because there's less magnification, less weight, it works with this really light slick, which is about 20 ounces. So now I've got 60 ounces instead of 100 ounces. And also, because this goes down to 15, I can do the same thing that I did with the 20 by 50, even better. Uh, in fact, I don't even need this. I could actually handhold that enough to be fairly useful. I never expected to, this to even be in the equation. Uh, the other great advantage of this is Ted, one time, well, he, he used to guide sheep hunters with this, and he, he did all his evaluations with this old scope back in the day. One time he dropped it in the river. It's not waterproof, so that's bad, right? He took it apart with these two, he put two knives in these little guys here, took it all apart, washed all the lenses, dried them with paper towel, uh, left them in the sun to dry, and then reassembled it, put it together wrong once, reassembled it again, put it together. That's kind of, there's an old school ruggedness here of something that is not quite as, you know, precise and fancy that allows you to do lots of stuff with this. And I don't know if you can break this scope. So, you know, this is a, a not a perfect, it doesn't have the perfect optics of today, but it's really, really good optics. As far as um, clarity, uh, of being able to see uh, detail, it's pretty good. It's just not that bright. And it's got a bit of chromatic uh, aberration. So it's not a perfect scope, but it's, it's, it's really actually quite good. So this is a 60 ounce option. Uh, do I wanna save 40 ounces, uh, three pounds basically? Uh, yeah, I do sometimes. So depending on the trip and how far I have to go, this is another option. The other thing I'm going to save weight on is when I go with my wife, I showed that video of the two-man keg of bivy. It's way too small for two people. But if you are sharing a quilt and getting really close in the, and you don't mind that because you're used to sleeping with your partner, not so bad. So that saves me. Instead of a three and a half pound tent, I'm taking a two pound two-man bivy. And instead of taking two sleeping bags, I'm taking one sleeping bag that'd be opened as a quilt. So that saves another pound. So right away, I've saved a lot of pounds and a lot of space. Uh, so that's another possibility of saving a little bit of weight when I go out with my wife. And then, of course, there's things like the costly, the most costly things you can save money on or save weight on. And I got a lot of crap for this because people see a really, you know, guy that's overweight and he's got this really light rifle. Well, this is a 280 AI. And I bought this because I really like my 7mm rim mag in uh, the Tika super lightweight. But this saves me a pound and a quarter. And then I put a really light scope on it. This is a 3 to 9 Vary X2. And people criticize you because everybody wants to have these big 30 millimeter scopes that go up to 20 power. I do not use the scope for evaluating game except at the very, very last stage. This thing goes up to nine. It's got the long range reticle. Uh, I'm pretty good with this to 600 yards. And the 280 AI is 
within 100 feet per second of this seven millimeter rem mag. This is an incredible rig. This is the this is the the, the tie version of the Weatherby Backcountry. So the Backcountry tie is a 4.9 pound rifle, and it shoots really really well. I'm getting just over an inch with uh, with uh, the one factory load I can find in Whitehorse, and I'm getting well under an inch with hand loads, the right kind of hand loads, and it's a really nice rifle to shoot. It's really really usable. Food. Uh, is another big piece. So uh, one pound, two ounces. My wife will not go out with me without coffee. So we could probably s uh, sleep in a little coffin, but she's going to need her coffee. And I'm going to need coffee too, because um, well, I'll tell you why in a bit. But here's my, uh, here's my stove system. And this is a little uh, MSR soloist pod or duelist, duelist pod, I forget what it's called. Um, I am heartbroken that I lost my Soto Windmaster because the Soto Windmaster is a heck of a stove. You can't buy them in Canada, I don't know why. Uh, so instead of uh, spending the money again to go all the way to the uh, United States and pay all the shipping and duty and all that stuff, I've got an MSR deluxe pocket rocket. And this is almost as good a stove. Um, the only thing that people say that I've used it is that the piezoelectric on the MSR is a little less reliable, but I always bring a, I always bring um, a lighter anyway, or five lighters. A little bit about food. Uh, I found the last time, I was out for uh, about 15 days uh, looking at sheep uh, two years ago. And I found I took 2,800 calories a day and I could not, uh, I could not eat enough. Like 2,800 calories was not enough food. But if you start taking more, you start adding a weight penalty. So I have uh, lost some weight by intermittent fasting. And what I've taught my body to do through going, f you know, fairly reduced carbohydrates and intermittent fasting is I've taught my body that it burns fat. Uh, so I'm already adapt fat adapted. Uh, I'm, I'm burning fat all the time, so I'm not starving. I'm just feeding off of my fat reserves, which I've laid down over the last 20 years. Um, and even at 230, I'm a light heavyweight. Uh, so when I'm really, when I was really fit, I was, uh, I was a light heavyweight in boxing. I was 170, I could make 178 pounds. So I'm 180 pounds, I'm a natural 180, 190 pounder. So, uh, I still have fat, lots of fat reserves at 220. So um, you don't go up into the mountains to lose weight, but if you lose a little bit of weight and you're fat adapted, it's okay. So I'm going to still bring the 2,500 calories. And I'm going to do one thing, which is a little bit different, is I'm not going to eat breakfast because I'm, I'm really liking this intermittent fasting. I'm liking what it brings to me health-wise. But I am going to... That's my breakfast, this bulletproof coffee. So we're gonna drink a cup of coffee in the morning and I'm gonna put all this healthy fat into the coffee. And so will my wife, but she'll probably have some oatmeal too. And uh, you know, I'm gonna have a normal kind of a fairly ha high fat lunch and a fairly high fat dinner. Spam and a giant cracker pilot biscuit. What could be better? Show the package, Sonny. It's classic. <laughs> We're gonna dehydrate our own food. I'm hoping to go with about a pound and a half of food a day uh, to get to 2,800 calories because I'm gonna go fairly fat rich. So that's another way of saving a little bit of weight is to get fat adapted, uh, teach your body. And you know, the only person I ever heard talk about this was Jason Haraldston and uh, the late great. Uh, and it's funny that you got such an incredible athlete talking about how to be fat adapted, but he taught himself to be fat adapted and that's what we're doing. That's what I'm doing right now. Like I'm doing exercise in the morning before I've eaten and I'm doing some fairly, you know, fairly good distances uh, without having eaten food. And I'm, I'm learning my, teaching my body how to burn its own fat reserves. And that'll come hand, handy on the mountain because you hear about people bonking People balk when they're used to getting calories in a certain way and then suddenly they don't have the calories. I'm not, I'm getting my body used to not getting those calories. 
So I think I'll be pretty resistant. And I was pretty resistant to it two years ago. Uh, I was far better with not eating than my son was. My son was ravenous the entire time. In fact, he ate a lot of my food. I'm not sure I always got all my 2,800 calories because my son was constantly hungry. So things like my, uh, my jerky, uh, he'd eaten all his jerky. Like I gave the jerky in three day packets. He'd eaten all his jerky in a day. And then he was looking at me like a wolf every time I was eating my jerky. So I'd have to give him part of mine. I had to encourage the little fella. But he wasn't fat adapted. I was fat adapted. And I didn't realize what a big difference that makes. How do you get fat adapted? Uh, cut out your carbs. Uh, skip breakfast. Uh, start slow. And exercise, um, you know, exercise before you've, uh, before you've eaten. At the, at the longest break of the fast, exercise and get your body used to exhausting all this glycogen uh, stores and then burning fat. And then when you're up on the mountain, you have, your body will know that pathway. So I haven't heard many people talk about that, but I'm, I'm interested in experimenting with that this summer. So that's a little bit of where we're at with, uh, with weight. Of course, we've got a low pack weight. Now we're going to have a low, uh, you know, they, they talk about the big three being your shelter and, uh, and a sleeping bag, sleeping system. We're going to be really low on that. We're going to be low on our food. Last, last resort, I'll be low on my optics. And I know that's a compromised decision, but, uh, you know, 61 years old, overweight, a little bit of back pain. Um, and I know that coming out with an 80 pound pack is going to be a hell of a thing when I am an animal in it, but, uh, that's only for the shortest possible distance. That'll be straight line distances where when we're hunting, we're not going straight line. We don't know where we'll end up. And I want to be able to put on a few more miles. So if I have to, if I have to compromise a bit on optics, I might have to compromise a bit on optics. It's probably my last, my last choice, but it's a choice that's there if I need to make it. So that's a little bit about weight and the sheep hunter's not, it's not uh, comprehensive, but it's my thoughts today. And I'm, you know, I, I'm really well aware that I'm not an expert and that somebody else could tell me a, a million things better than what I'm doing. But this is uh, my thinking at the present based on my experience and what's happened in the past. So thanks for watching.